you have your Bibles, turn to Proverbs chapter 24, please. I got a message today from Pastor that told me uh, that Brother George would have 10 minutes for the RU graduation. <laughs> so you would have plenty of time to preach. It turns out that Brother George had plenty of time for the RU graduation. I've got 10 minutes to preach. I was, uh, I was preaching, uh, I think it was in Colorado a few years ago, and a, uh, a pastor, we, we were there on a Sunday night, and he told me, he said, I, I'm going to have you preach on the radio in the morning, and he said, I, I'd love for you to preach that same sermon. I said, wonderful. He said, I want you to tell every story, every illustration, and uh, make sure you, you go through every point, point." and I said, certainly, I'll be happy to do it, and he said you have seven minutes on the radio. And so uh, I think I have about a little more than seven minutes, but, uh, well, I'll tell you, it is an honor for me. I, I'm, I'm excited to see the accomplishments of these dear folk. Um, and the ladies come to our Sunday school class, so it's, it's a little even more special for us. And certainly glad to see them and their families that are here uh, tonight. I would like to say, Really, uh, someone had asked me earlier to, to uh, say a word just about the college tour groups. I appreciate your prayers for them. Uh, Brother Eddie is in Michigan with a men's group tonight. Uh, Brother Chris Teft is in Maine. Uh, Brother uh, Anthony Collins is in Las Vegas. I don't know. That's, that's what I hear. Um, and uh, Brother Sammy's group is down in Louisiana. And you be praying for these folks. And uh, boy, our tour groups are doing so well. And I, yeah, I, if I could just say this, uh, I know that uh, Pastor uh, gave somewhat of an explanation as to his travels. Our tour groups are in 51 churches this year that for whatever reason did not take us last year. And a large reason, in fact, the biggest reason of all is Brother John Wilkerson. Everywhere I go, people uh, brag about our pastor. Uh, everywhere I go, and I travel a lot, uh, they all say, boy, you got, a, you got the right man. You got the real deal, what a, what a man Brother Wilkerson is. And, and I have been with him when he's been offered meetings, and he has said to them, I need 24 hours to pray about it before I'll give you any kind of an answer. So he, he is a, uh, we're honored and our college is blessed and favored because he travels. Um, I, I just, uh, anyway, for whatever that's worth, I just wanted to throw that out there. On behalf of the college and as president of the college, I'm delighted that he's out there because everywhere he goes, he, he uh, speaks well on our behalf. And the college is looking good. Uh, we have more than 200 apps for this fall, 200 more than we had at this point last year. And so uh, we're very excited and encouraged about that. All right, Proverbs chapter 24. I'll read one verse. I've got three points, and I'm going to run through it as quickly as I can. Proverbs chapter 24. The Bible says, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. I had a sermon ready to preach, but I didn't feel like it was the right one, and so I wrote this one down just before church, and I trust that the Lord will use it to be a help to us tonight. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time you've given us and for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for these that have made the effort to be here tonight. And God, we'd ask that you would guide our words and our thoughts and speak to us now as only you can, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. In 1986, my wife and I, we moved to uh, actually, 1985, right after we graduated from college, we moved to Los Angeles, and we were out there at, uh, in 86 when the California Angels were in the playoffs, and they were, just, they were one out from the World Series. They were leading in the game, and Donnie Moore came in from the bullpen. Donnie Moore had been one of the most reliable relievers. They were up three games to one in the series, just one out away from the World Series. Donnie Moore came in, and I, I can still see him as he walked from the bullpen area and came to the mound and took the hill in a, in a situation where he was just moments away from putting his team 
and their franchise in a great position. But it didn't work out so well. Donnie Moore gave up the go-ahead run, and eventually the California Angels tied it in the ninth inning. Then the 11th inning, they lost the game 7-6. to six. Donnie Moore said that everywhere he went, he couldn't get past people reminding him about that debacle. Our team was so close, and you blew it. We were right there, and he said he would go out to eat with his family in restaurants, and people would say, you're the guy that blew it. You lost it for us. Three years later, in July of 1989, Donnie Moore took his life. He was a Major League Baseball player, but he said the ridicule for that one event in his life, he never could get past it. It just stayed there and continued to haunt him, and so he made a terrible choice that we would think, no, nobody's ever got to make that kind of a decision. But the truth of the matter is, in these three points, let me say this first of all, let people get up. Let people get up. You see, don't remind people about their past. Because, you know, as we watch these graduates come across the platform tonight, it's no different than you and me. You may have had a better upbringing and a better education and a little more uh, things afforded to you along life's road, but there go all of us, but by the grace of God. We're no better sinners than anybody else in here. We don't dress up any prettier than anybody else in here. We don't smell any nicer. Our sin is not nicer sin than somebody else's. We're all filthy, rotten, wretched, vile sinners that ought to be in hell right now. And so don't ever forget, you got to, the Bible says that a just man right, falleth seven times and riseth up again, but he doesn't get up unless people let him get up. So let people get up by not reminding them of their past. When I was in high school, I went to public school all the way through and uh, except the very end, but I was in 11th grade and it was right near the end of the school year. And uh, we had a big, big high school, but our, our high school was unique. It had no windows. They, were, they thought it was going to be better economically, and so we had no windows, and about 2,000 students in the high school. I was in a, uh, a class uh, uh, with an English teacher. Her name was Mrs. Medlin, and she was a real sweetheart of a lady. In fact, she would read the Bible before class, and she got away with it in those days because it was deemed a literary work. And so she'd begin class, and right there on the front of her desk was her Bible. And she'd start reading. She'd read a passage every single morning. And, uh, but I, Mrs. Medlin had a lot of allergies. She was allergic to a lot of different things. And um, in fact, I remember one time I was, I was sitting over against the wall, and we had this long line of uh, air conditioning and heating units. And I, I remember watching the girls as they would come in, and Mrs. Medlin, if the girls had too much perfume on, she would ask them to leave. She'd cover her mouth and say, I, I can't bear to have you in class, and so you'll need to leave. I remember one time seeing Mrs. Medlin in the middle of class. She walked to the back of the room while she was teaching. She never missed a beat. And she pulled out a syringe, and she just gave herself a shot right there in the middle of class. And I thought, well, I've never seen that before. There was a girl that sat in front of me, and she was quite the antagonist, and she was always conspiring to do something, and, and I remember she told me one day, she said, uh, she said, your mom sells Avon, right? My mom sold Avon. You remember those beautiful decanters that you could get? And uh, I remember the fragrance for men in that day, I think, was wild country. Anybody remember that? Some of you thinking, don't knock it, man, I'm wearing it tonight. And that's why you're still single. But anyway. <laughs> and so they had all these beautiful decanters. And the girl said to me, she said, I know what we can do. She said, you bring some cologne tomorrow. She said, and we'll all get out of class. It was near the end of the year, and I thought it sounded like a great idea. By the way, a lot of ideas sound great, but they don't work out so well. It's like when somebody says, watch this, you better be real careful. So the next day, we showed up for English class, and I think there were two weeks yet remaining in the school year. It was in May. It was very hot. And I walked into English class, and Mrs. Medlin began the class with a Bible reading. And uh, 
wasn't but a couple minutes into the class period and and uh, she was collecting papers and I, I remember taking out the bottle of cologne and I can see it like it was a moment ago and I poured that entire bottle all of its contents in the vents for the air conditioning unit because I thought that the moment that the air conditioning kicks in it'll wild country will be all over the room and we'll get dismissed early for the day and so sure enough it wasn't probably five minutes or so we could hear it just start to rolling and then the the fan started blowing and I was right over against it so I could smell it real quickly and I smelled that wild country coming through the classroom and Mrs. Medlin was up a at the front of the classroom and she was leaning against uh, the desk and all of her books were here and her medicines she had a pharmacy on the desk and I saw all of that and all of a sudden Mrs. Medlin she just kind of stopped for a moment and got real quiet and her eyes just kind of froze and Mrs. Medlin went out cold hit the ground right there right there in front of God and everybody right there on the classroom floor it wasn't funny then one of the girls came up and she was all hysterical and she looked at Mrs. Medlin and she screamed out she's not breathing now it's real serious I'm thinking I'm about to go to Shawshank <laughs> we had a little pool chain in the in the classroom and they pulled on the chain and called the, the the principal's office and they sent some people running and it wasn't but a couple minutes and uh, the paramedics were there she's still not breathing she's out paramedics come in give her a big shot put her on this gurney take her out oxygen whole nine yards that was a bad day that was a real bad day I walked out of the class and and I was getting ready to leave and they all said who's responsible for this everybody in the class at that time everybody tells on you when you just killed your teacher you're in trouble <laughs> so they all pointed at me and so I was taken down to the principal's office and I was dismissed from school I was told that I'd never be allowed to return unless mrs. Medlin okayed it well the problem was she was not doing real well she was in the hospital and I I asked uh, I asked the principal I said would it be all right if I went to see her in the hospital and her family had said that I could not visit her in the hospital they felt I was trying to finish the deal <laughs> that's a true story every bit of that happened you can ask my wife but it's amazing I was uh, I was pastoring in Kentucky about 20 years later and I uh, I took our church to see Mammoth Cave and we're touring Mammoth Cave and going through one of the caverns and the guide looks real familiar to me I'm thinking I know this guy from somewhere and I, he starts giving me a hard time and I'm the pastor leading this group and I couldn't figure out why and he told me he said I know who you are he was my assistant principal from high school 20 years before five years later I'm at a McDonald's in Kentucky and my dad sitting down with me and I look across the way and I said I think I know who that is and my dad said well let's go over and talk to him and I introduced myself and his first words were I know who you are <laughs> it was my principal from that high school 25 years he knew who I was because of one act by the way mrs. Medlin survived and I did go over to her house and I apologized and she said don't think a thing about it but I thought a lot about it ever since then <laughs> but that one episode was forever etched in the memory of two men who every time each time they saw me they said I know who you are based on one incident and if you do not allow people to get up and you're always telling them I know who you are you don't really know who they are when the Bible says that a just man falleth but he riseth up again one of the key and compelling reasons that is incumbent upon each and every one of us as God's children is that we let people get up don't remind them of their past and then secondly under that thought don't spread the dirt 
You know something about somebody, keep it to yourself. You don't, you don't have to justify it by saying I'm speaking the truth in love. Every once in a while, someone will say to me, did you hear about so-and-so? And I'm always the last to know. I'm not the first. To, by the way, if you're the first to know, that's probably not a good sign. If you're in the loop and in the know about everything, that, that's probably not a good indicator that you're the type of person that wants to help and let people get up. Let them get over their past. Don't remind them of their past. And don't tell others about their past. And not a person on this platform all the way to the back chair in here. Every one of us have some things we wish we hadn't done. You may not be a member of the RU home, but you probably could have if you'd been caught. You were ordered to come here. You and I may not. You say, well, Brother Mason, I don't have anything in my past. Each and every one of us, there's things we wish we hadn't done. There's a crowd we wish we hadn't run with. There's things we wish we hadn't said. There's items we wish we hadn't placed before our eyes. And were it not for the grace of God, we'd be a mess tonight. And the only way a just man gets up is if we as God's people let them get up. Number one, let people get up. Number two, not only let people get up, but help people get up. The Bible says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You see, if, it's, it's very easy to say, well, okay, I'm going to let people get up. I'm going to allow people to recover. I'm going to allow people to find relief, and I'm going to allow people to get back on the right track. But it's another thing altogether to help people get up. Because what we have to do then is a lot of times we have to get dirty. A lot of times we have to get down where they are. It's just like the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, the Bible says that he went where he was. You see, many times in life, we're content to be that religious crowd because we're on duty for the Lord, and what we're doing is very important, and it's righteous, and it's just, and it's, it's sound, and it's solid, and we're so preoccupied with all the things that we're doing so we can't stop to help a brother who's fallen. We can't bend down to help someone. We don't have time to hear their story. We don't want to take the hours that it takes to, to reach down and to, to be willing to go where somebody is and, and to uh, 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 try to lend an ear and lend a hand, but that's exactly what the Good Samaritan did that day. He said, let me step down and let me be a help and let me find out that he's cared for and let me check on him again. A lot of times it's a cursory, cursory, cursory prayer that we'll give. We may think about it. I've been as guilty as anybody perhaps when someone's name has been mentioned for a prayer request. The name is given and we'll say, Lord, help them. Lord, bless them but we never give it another thought until we hear it mentioned again the next time we're in church or we get a prayer alert or something like that. Let people get up, but help people get up. First of all, in meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. I've got family members that have messed up their lives, but I'm no better than them. I'm, a, I'm as sorry. It's, it's a wonder to me that God would ever save me, much less use me. I don't think for a minute that I'm somebody because I'm nobody. I don't think I'm better than anybody else. And I think we all have to make sure that we maintain a spirit of meekness that doesn't just say, there go I, but by the grace of God, but puts it to practice in our hearts and in our lives. Amen. Help people get up in meekness. And then secondly under that, help people get up with our words. Our words. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 3, exhort one another daily. How good does it feel when somebody gives you a good word? You ever had a bad day? We've all had bad days. We've all had days we wish we could forget. We've all had those moments we'd like to erase. We've all had those, oh, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I entertained that thought. I can't believe I traveled down that road. I can't believe I made that choice. I can't believe I did this. And you know, it's always amazed me that God has always put somebody in my path with a good word. 
There's always been somebody that has been at the right time. You know, there's a song that says he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Well, he may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time because he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. And I think what God would like for each of us to be as God's people is on-time Christians. And I don't mean showing up for church on time, though that'd be good and noble. But I mean the kind of person that when you know somebody needs a word, you've got a word. When you know somebody's down, you're not focused solely on yourself and your problems and your predicaments, because we could all do that. Each and every one of us could sit in the, 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 the mully dump sometime and, and focus on, well, you don't know what's going on in my life? No, I don't, but I know this. There's some people here on any given service, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, are wondering if they're, they're not wondering about next week, next month. They're wondering about the next 24 hours. Are they going to make it? Are they going to get so discouraged that they go off to the deep end and they go off and do something that ruins and wrecks their future and robs them of any opportunity down the road? And every single time they show up in the house of God, you know what? they need they need a good word we walk around and we get an we get an opportunity to handshake and sometimes we you know we stay in uh, in our little cocoon you know we we'll turn around and get to people in front of us we'll turn around and get to people behind us and we're that, that that's us and I know it's tough in a church our size but there's somebody in your zip code that needs a good word tonight there's, there'll be somebody that you'll come across on Sunday morning that needs a good word. Let people get up. Help people get up. Help them in meekness. Help them in words. And then help them in our actions. The Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, two are better than one, for if one fall, the other shall pick him up. You know, there have been times in my life when I wanted to well, there have been a couple times in my life, I'll be just very candid, where I wanted to leave the ministry. I just had enough. I know you're probably not supposed to say that. That's all right, my 10 minutes is almost up anyway. <laughs> I think of two occasions in particular, I really wanted to walk away. I was, I was fed up, fired up, Give me a couple of minutes, I'll put another one in there and make a literated outline. <laughs> but I was ready to pack it up. And a good word from my wife kept me going. And it's probably so you give testimony tonight of a time when a good word kept you going. I remember my Sunday school teacher in sixth grade, Mrs. Westover. All the Sunday school teachers I ever had, and I was in church all my life, but every Sunday morning, we'd leave her class. It was about six boys in there. It wasn't even a large class. Mrs. Westover would look at us, and she'd say, you're special. God loves you. You're going to do something for God one day. You know, the first couple times I heard that, I thought, this lady's nuts. She not right in the head. I mean, I really thought that. I thought, Some, something's not right here. But you know, after a while... I'd show up on Sunday mornings. I'd look for Mrs. Westover to say something. She'd say something about what we'd wear. Boy, you look sharp today. Dad bought me one of those new clip-on ties. I put that thing on. Man, I was looking fine. All polished and shiny. Mrs. Westover would say, Stu, you sure look nice today. And you know what? I like to hear it. I'd come back the next Sunday and I'd sit there and I'd be attentive in class and I'd sit there and I'd, I'd hang on to every word she was saying. But before I ever left that day, Mrs. Westover would say, boy, God sure does love you, Stuart, and you're going to do something great for God someday. I'm not sure that I've ever done anything good for God, much less great for God. But I know that back there many years ago, there was a woman who showed up for church every day for six boys in the sixth grade, and she was faithful Sunday morning, Sunday morning, Sunday morning. I don't ever recall her missing, but to this very moment, I can remember when I needed somebody to give me a good word, she had it. Help people get up. Help them in meekness. Help them in words. Help them in your actions. Point number one, let people get up. Point number two, help people get up. And the point number three, get yourself up. 
Get yourself up. Remember who you are. The Bible says that you are accepted in the beloved. When my father and mother forsake me, help me out here, the Lord will lift me up. You know what that means? It doesn't matter what I have done in the past or what I have yet to do in the future. I'm God's. If I mess up royally tomorrow, if I do something wrong that shames my Savior and forfeits every opportunity in the future, I'm still His. I'm still His. And each and every one of us are going to wrestle and struggle with sin and temptation and waywardness and thoughts for the rest of our days as long as we're drawing a breath in this life. But you got to get yourself up. Sometimes when temptation comes and we fall, we're our worst enemy. Now, I'm not talking about condoning sin, but I am saying this, don't be so hard on yourself. You've never done anything that God hasn't forgiven already. And by the way, whatever sins you've yet to commit, he already died for those. It's not something new that he has to address. Now, you do need to seek God for forgiveness, and you do need to confess, and you do need to forsake it, but you have to understand something. God knows that when he saved you, he saved a sinner who is still a sinner. Quit kicking yourself. The world will do a fine job of it. You don't have to beat yourself up. Sometimes a young person will come to me and say, Brother Mason, I messed up. I don't rip their head off. Because usually when they come and they say they've messed up, they've already taken care of hurting themselves over it already. They have already done enough about themselves already. Let people get up. Help people get up. Get yourself up. Remember who you are. Then secondly, under that, remember to whom you belong. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that I am Christ. I am Christ. That's an amazing verse. It means I'm his. My wife and I, in a few days, will celebrate our 30th anniversary, and I often say that I married way up, and I did. But you think about salvation. I got righteousness for filthy rags. I got hope by giving up my guilt. I got an eternity in heaven by giving up my shame. I got the peace of God that passeth understanding by letting go of my sin and letting him have it. If there was ever anybody that ever got a bad deal, it was God. He got you and me. But one of the things that we have to do if we're ever going to get up is we got to get ourselves up. Remember who you are. Remember to whom you belong. And then finally, remember where you're headed. The Bible says in Hebrews, for, we, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. No matter what happens in life, as a child of God, they can't take heaven. They can take your house. They can take your car. They can garnish your wages. They can level settlement and judgment against you. But they can't touch heaven. And as a child of God, you can't lose that. Remember who you are. Remember to whom you belong. Remember where you're headed. Let people get up. Help people get up. Get yourself up. I finish with this story. I love March Madness. It's the most wonderful time of the year. There's a song written about it. It's the most wonderful time of the year. You've heard it perhaps. There was a, a guard for... Virginia Commonwealth University. And in this year's tournament, they were ahead of Stephen Austin. They had a four-point lead with 10 seconds 
left. His name was Jaquan Lewis. And Stephen Austin was one of the players was driving down the court with less than 10 seconds left. And a cardinal rule in basketball is that you don't do anything stupid here. You got a four-point lead, less than 10 seconds to go. This game's over unless you do stupid. Jaquan Lewis, without even thinking about what he was doing, taking consideration to the time on the clock or any of the matters at hand, he fouls a jump shooter behind the three-point line. And the shot goes through, nothing but net. And the official raises his hand to signal a foul call. And as the ball is going through the net, the, the team assembles and Jaquan Lewis is just sitting there. His teammates are throwing their hands up in disgust and contempt. What are you thinking? And what are you, are you not paying attention? How could you have let this happen? And as that would happen, Stephen F. Austin, the player who hit the three, stepped to the line. Just seconds left in regulation. If he sinks this free throw, we're headed to overtime. He steps to the foul line and launches the shot. Nothing but net. We head to overtime. That entire overtime period, the announcers are saying that if Virginia Commonwealth loses this game, Jaquan Lewis will never get over it. They kept saying it. Boy, he'll never forget this. He'll never live this down. He'll never get past this. And Stephen F. Austin took the lead in overtime, was up by two points with seven seconds left in overtime, and Jaquan Lewis had the ball. And boy, to make a perfect storybook, he launches a three from the corner as the game is about to expire. He's down two. He hits the shot. He goes from a goat to a hero. But that's not what happened. He missed the shot. And he instantly fell to the floor, and he was laid out and sprawling. The other team is running all over the place celebrating. Look what we did. Look what we did. And the announcers continue to say, Jaquan Lewis will never forget this. This will stay with him the rest of his life. But it was amazing what happened. All those guys on the bench that moments before were looking at him thinking, I can't believe what you did. Why did you do that? That was so foolish. No, no, no. Not now. They all ran over to Jaquan Lewis, starting with the head coach and every one of his teammates, and they picked him up. These aren't necessarily Christians. This is a state college. They picked him up, and they're patting him on the back, and they're hugging him, and they're rubbing his head, and they're telling him, don't worry about it. And the coach grabs him and hugs him and kisses him on the cheek, sweat running all down his face. You know why? Because they knew that if Jaquan Lewis was ever going to get past this in life, somebody better help him get up. And you know, when you and I come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sometimes God will put somebody in your pew that is waiting for a child of God to help them get up. And to do that, you've got to let them get up. You've got to help them get up. And you've got to continually remind yourself to get yourself up. Lord, we thank you for the time you've given us. Thank you for the great testimonies given here tonight of lives that are changed and Lord, I do pray that you'd help us to be a help to someone. Lord, would you send people across our paths that you would help if you were in our shoes. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us. May we do that and more to those that you would allow us to do. We pray in Jesus' name.